the uh, first words I spoke in the original phonograph. A little piece of practical poetry. Mary had a little lamb, its feet was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. I believe they are. My opponents do not. I believe in the right of the people to rule. I believe that the majority of the plain people of the United States will, day in and day out, make fewer mistakes in governing themselves than any smaller class or body of men, no matter what their training, will make in trying to govern. I believe again that the American people are, as a whole, capable of self-control and of learning by their mistakes. Our opponents pay lip lawyers to this doctrine, but they show their real beliefs by the way in which they champion every device to make the nominal rule of the people a sham. I am not leading this fight as a matter of aesthetic pleasure. I am leading because somebody must lead or else the fight would not be made at all. I prefer to work with moderate, with rational conservatives, provided only that they do in good faith strive forward toward the light. But when they halt and turn their backs to the light, sit with the scorners on the seats of reaction, then I must part company with them. We, the people, cannot turn back. Our aim must be steady, wise progress. It would be well if our people would study the history of a sister republic. All the woes of France for a century and a quarter have been due to the folly of her people in splitting into the two camps of unreasonable conservatism and unreasonable radicalism. Had pre-revolutionary France listened to men like Turgot and backed them up, all would have gone well. But the beneficiaries of privilege, the Bourbon reactionaries, the short-sighted ultra-conservatives turned down Turgot and then found that instead of him they had obtained Robespierre. They gained 20 years' freedom from all restraint and reform at the cost of the whirlwind of the Red Terror, and in their turn the unbridled extremists of the Terror induced a blind reaction. And so, with convulsion and oscillation from one extreme to another, with alternations of violent radicalism and violent bourbonism, the French people went through misery toward a shattered door. May we profit by the experiences of our brother Republicans across the water, and go forward steadily avoiding all wild extremes. And may our ultra-conservatives remember that the rule of the Bourbons brought on the revolution. And may our would-be revolutionaries remember that no Bourbon was ever such a dangerous enemy of the people and of freedom as the professed friend of both Robespierre. There is no danger of a revolution in this country, but there is grave discontent and unrest, and in order to remove them, there is need of all the wisdom and probity and deep-seated faith in and purpose to uplift humanity we have at our command. Friends, 
Our task as Americans is to strive for social and industrial justice achieved through the genuine rule of the people. This is our end, our purpose. The methods for achieving the end are merely expedients to be finally accepted or rejected according as actual experience shows that they work well or ill. But in our hearts we must have this lofty purpose and we must strive for it in all earnestness and sincerity or our work will come to nothing. In order to succeed, we need leaders of inspired idealism, leaders to whom are granted great visions, who dream greatly and strive to make their dreams come true, who can kindle the people with the fire from their own burning souls. The leader for the time being, whoever he may be, is but an instrument to be used until broken and then to be cast aside. And if he is worth his salt, he will care no more when he is broken than a soldier cares when he is sent where his life is forfeit in order that the victory may be won. In the long fight for righteousness, the watchword for all of us is spend and be spent. Constructed. This work was assigned to me. The object of this invention was the transmission of several telegraph messages over one wire at the same time, utilizing the fact that a tuned reed will vibrate when its own note is sounded near it. This is a receiver of Bell's telegraph with its magnet and steel reed. The transmitter had, in addition, contact points, which, when its reed vibrated, would send corresponding electric impulses through the distant receiver. If that receiver's reed was tuned to the pitch of these pulsations, it would respond. I made for Bell six transmitters with reeds of six different pitches, and six receivers with their reeds tuned to correspond. But the apparatus did not work very well. Bell was obliged constantly to retune the receiver reed. When doing this, he had the habit of putting the receiver against his ear. This led to a most important discovery. During the months that we were experimenting on his telegraph, Bell often spoke to me of another invention he was struggling with. It was the telephone. I remember my surprise when he first told me he expected soon to be able to talk by telegraph. He explained to me his wonderful idea of an electric current which would copy the vibrations of speech and described a complex telephone he had devised. It was never constructed as it was too expensive. June 2nd, 1875 is the most important day in the history of the telephone. For on that day, Bell got a glimpse that showed him the road leading to the realization of his speaking telephone idea. That afternoon, his harmonic telegraph was working worse than ever. One of the steel reeds in my room stopped vibrating. I snapped it several times to start it. When Bell came rushing from the other room in great excitement, he told me that he had heard in the receiver at his ear the actual sound of the spring I had snapped. It was the first real sound that had ever been transmitted to a human ear by electricity and he was sure that the same mechanism could also transmit speech. That very afternoon, Bell gave me 
direction for making the first speaking telephone. Here is an exact duplicate of it. It has one of the telegraph receivers set in a frame with the free end of its reed attached to the center of a drum head and a mouthpiece to talk into. Bell's idea was to force the reed to follow the voice vibrations instead of merely swinging to and fro. I made two of these telephones the next day, and we tested them on the evening of June 3rd, 1875. I could hear the sound of Mr. Bell's voice and could almost understand some of his words. But my voice was not then strong enough to make him hear a sound. He was disappointed, but was sure he was on the right track. Many experiments on the telephone followed during the next two years. Here are a few of the many telephones I made for Bell during that period. On March 10, 1876, the telephone transmitted its first complete sentence. Mr. Watson, please come here. I want you. On October 9, 1876, the first conversation over a real wire was carried on by Mr. Bell and myself. The wire was two miles long, running from Boston to Cambridge. The telephone was ready for public use in the spring of 1877, two years after the first telephone was made. This is one of the first telephones ever put into commercial use.